A wait that lasted years. The anticipation of this new game only grew with more and more promises for what it could be. Delays after delays until it's finally released and... What happened? Back in August of 2018, Scott Cawthon and Steel Wool Studios announced a partnership for the new Five Nights at Freddy's game, which was going to be strictly a VR experience for Steam, Oculus, and PlayStation. While some people were unhappy with a strictly VR port, there were quite a lot of people excited for this game, including myself. There were a few complications during production, such as this original teaser cover art design that was added to Scott Games. When the crew at Steel Wool was designing it, they didn't realize which of the models were actually Scott made and which were fan made, and ended up using this Funtime Foxy design from Gabo Coart and this Spring Bonnie model from the fan-made Pop Goes series. There was barely any marketing for this game, mostly just still frames and the game teasers. A lot of this game was hidden and kept under wraps, but pushing through all of this, the game released on May 28th of 2019 after a 7 day delay, and it was one of the greatest FNAF experiences ever. While the story was not very good and there was almost no new content, the ability to experience these games in virtual reality was one thing most of the FNAF players really wanted, so finally getting the ability to do so was both amazing and absolutely terrifying. And then, only a few short months later, the Halloween DLC came out that added a whole bunch of new terrifying additions and a hilariously on-the-nose Dreadbear animatronic. The most important thing that came from this game was Vanny. We were very slowly introduced to this character through unlockable tapes that could be listened to. We learned that this character was a developer of the FNAF VR game, but was corrupted by a virus that was William Afton himself. She starts off unwilling to complete everything that William is asking of her, but eventually she gives in and begins to kill. As you progress through the Halloween DLC, you begin to see more and more signs of Annie until, in a grand finale, you come across her mask and put it on, being fully introduced to the first new antagonist in the FNAF games. On August 8th of 2019, FNAF's five-year anniversary, Security Breach was teased. December 25th, 2020 was the announced release day for Security Breach. A short while later, this teaser image on Scott's website changed twice. Once, a number, and once, another Security Breach teaser. Many people suspected that the day was slowly but steadily approaching, especially considering the lack of VR teasers. And while the hype slowly but steadily grew and the release day got closer and closer, we got a different game. Security Breach was delayed, but instead, Scott released Freddy in Space 2 for the fans to play while we wait. While this was a nice wait, everyone was still anticipating this new game, and a lot of fans were disappointed, especially considering there were no other official release dates given, only a delay. With the way FNAF VR was handled, the delay was only a week long, so this didn't look too bad. And so we waited, and a week passed, and nothing. Disappointment grew with the lack of communication being given to the fans. But eventually, we got our first new teaser. At first glance, it looked the exact same as the previous teaser, but now we have a shadowy figure in the window, which was quickly figured out to be Vanny. There was finally a new teaser for Security Breach, and this one showed our brand new antagonist. The excitement grew again. The day is finally coming. Uh, what? Who are you? A new teaser was released, but not for Security Breach. Another FNAF game that isn't Security Breach came out. The long-lasting FNAF fans are so used to getting these games either almost on time or even earlier than expected, but this time, two other FNAF games and a DLC have come out since Security Breach was teased. Finally, the Security Breach teasers were coming in. One, after another, after another, after another, after another, after another. It was amazing. Soon we got actual trailers for this game. September 16th, 2020, we got our first trailer. Our anticipation grew exponentially. Then one after another, we were getting close to the release, showing us huge areas with amazing shots of our new antagonist being an actual antagonist. And finally, December 16th, 2021, let's see how it looks. You're stuck. Oh! What the hell? Oh. Freddy! I'm ascending! Come on! Oh! Oh! What? <laughs> but I'm talking about high workouts. What happened?
This game was released like 2014's Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric or even Cyberpunk 2077. It felt untested, unfinished, unpolished, and rushed to meet its deadline. Animatronics were rough and not smooth, textures don't load correctly, animatronics constantly and repetitively get stuck, rooms wouldn't load, and, this may seem backwards, but the graphics were too high. If you tried to record this game for the first time, your game, recording, and entire computer would start capturing everything at a whopping 4 frames per second. If you didn't have two RTX 3090s and tried to make a video on this game, you'll have to start dropping your in-game graphics tremendously, which would make the game look super unfinished, but it's the only way to play and record at the same time. And if your computer wasn't up to date on the latest hardware, chances were that you would have a very difficult time playing it, and if not now, then very soon. Updates started coming in. Patching all of these fixes that should have seemingly been patched earlier, but also increasing PC and hardware usage, which negated another chunk of the players. There were different glitches and bugs that would happen for different versions of the game, which was super fun for the speedrun.com moderators to deal with. And now, the gameplay. This game was terrifying for five minutes. The tutorial of the game is a literal chase sequence, and you have to run from not one, not two, but all three hostile animatronics. And then, nothing is even remotely scary until we get to the generators and daycare, but even then, with the new update where we have glow-in-the-dark wires, it negates the scary factor of this area too. And then, that's it. The game just isn't scary. Why is that? Well, there's a few reasons. The first one is the lighting. The original games like FNAF 1, we have this orange filament style tint to it, and while you can still see, there are some terrifying and necessary dark spots. FNAF 2 had the same vibe, but with even more dark spots that anything could come from. FNAF 3 was similar, but just with a green tint to make everything look sick, and FNAF 4 was not only in a bedroom, but was super dark and terrifying while still being able to see a few key points, which adds another layer of terror. But Security Breach is super bright, and while you can change the brightness in the settings of the game, all these lights are these bright fluorescent or LED type lights which just aren't that scary. A great way to show this in another way is by looking at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. The first bunch of these movies had these orangey yellow tinted lights that felt very unsettling, but the newest movie had this scene. And while the lighting is dark, these types of lights turn it from creepy to goofy. It just doesn't feel the same. Another big aspect to why it wasn't scary was the location. The previous games were set with a very creepy aesthetic. A haunted house, a bedroom in the middle of the night, an underground bunker. Ugh, Chuck E. Cheese. But a mall is just, I mean, it's a mall. An old mall can be terrifying, but a new, renovated, futuristic mall is just not very scary. Just look at the ending of Stranger Things Season 3. It was an amazing sequence with a lot of emotional moments, but the final fight wasn't scary, but it doesn't seem like it was necessarily trying to be scary. This, however, is way too bright and wide-eyed to be scary. Don't get me wrong, the future can be terrifying. Just look at Alien but it's very hard to create a scary aesthetic with the bright and colorful side of the future. What I think the biggest element for why it wasn't scary was the power dynamic. You start the game with nothing. You have to run and hide to get away from these animatronics. This was a great parallel with the original games where you can only shut the doors and turn on the lights as you slowly run out of power, but then you start getting some ways to defend yourself. Inherently, this isn't bad. I liked the way to hide in Glamrock Freddy but then they started giving us more. First, a Fazer Blaster, then a Fazcam. These both are used to render the animatronics completely immobile. Then, you start upgrading Freddy to add even more defenses, and then you get to the point that you can defend from any animatronic while in Freddy, but then you factor in the skill. In every FNAF game, you fully rely on your skill to make you better at the game and live longer, but this game also gives you these defenses. So when you get to the point of being able to dodge Roxy's dash attacks and juke Glamrock Chica, you can now also cancel Monty with these defenses, so none of the animatronics can even touch you. So now, the only enemies that can make this game scary 
are completely irrelevant in this fetch quest turned game, but I'll get to that in a minute. At this point, you might just be thinking that I'm being mad because I'm an original FNAF fan and it used to be a horror game, but I have to move on now that it isn't, but it's still being marketed as a horror game. The first two tags on Steam are horror and survival horror, but this just wasn't. Now, if a not scary FNAF game was the only problem, this wouldn't be a video. The next thing we need to discuss, which is how I started this video, is the way the game was marketed compared to the rest of the other games. With FNAF VR, we had multiple gameplay trailers that were very cryptic at times. Just like the trailers to the other games, they gave away almost none of the plot in these teasers and only showed a little bit of what you can do in this game while still keeping so much under wraps for you to discover during the game. However, Security Breach was not only different, but the exact opposite. We got more teasers, reveals, and trailers than any other game. We kept getting information that this was the biggest FNAF game ever, and this was backed up by the constant delays of the game, increasing our anticipation even more. But when playing this game, they showed us so much of these very exciting things in the trailer that just didn't show up. One of the biggest things from the trailers was a thing that got every FNAF fan super excited for what this could possibly mean for the future of Five Nights at Freddy's was this line here from an unknown entity. You will do as I say. You will bring me what I want. And if you fail me, then you will. Both of you burn! This line was huge. And playing this game, we were waiting and anticipating this line until finally, it doesn't show up. We just don't get it. It's not in the game. This new, seemingly powerful presence and character line is just gone. And while this sounds slightly like Monty, it also sounds very different, so we just never know who it was. But of course, one instance of a scrapped line isn't that big of a deal, but again, if this was the only incident, I wouldn't be discussing it. In another trailer, we hear this. When I first found you, you were nothing. You were small, pathetic, but now you are more. Are you ready? We can easily infer who this could possibly be, but another very anticipated lore drop was just gone from the game. But these trailers also ran into what I like to call the movie trailer problem. Every previous game trailer showed just enough to get you hooked on the game while still revealing practically everything big in the actual game. These trailers, however, showed so many of the big cutscenes in the game that they practically showed us everything there is to show that isn't the endings. They reveal the entire intro cutscene, fighting the animatronics, destroying the animatronics, the amazing transition from sun to moon, Fanny's chase sequence, the DJ Music Man chase, still encountering the broken animatronics, and the broken staff bots. They revealed so much that when playing the game, it just felt like you were watching the trailer at 0.05 times speed. There was so little to be excited for that you haven't already seen. These trailers also gave us a lot of Vanny. The first 22 seconds of one of these trailers is strictly about Vanny, and every trailer teased her in one way or another. We had the concept of Vanny hammered into our heads for years and years, but where was she? We see her six times at most. A cutscene outside of daycare for three seconds, the lost and found plus main entrance sequence, a few seconds in the backstage cutscene, a very short time only in the destroy Chica sequence, and the Vanny ending. That's it. This antagonist that was hyped for almost three years was in less than 10 minutes of the total game. Moon chases you more than the main antagonist. So what happened? Who was the actual antagonist? Oh no, 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 no! Security Breach pulled a Rise of Skywalker. But, I mean, for an already undead character, how bad could this possibly be? Well, FNAF 3 had ended with the burning of Springtrap, and that was seemingly the end of his new life. 
but we get a huge reveal at the end of Sister Location's custom night that William is still around. Then we have Pizzeria Simulator that brings him back, but in one of the biggest and greatest twists and endings in all of Five Nights at Freddy's. Henry interrupts the end of your final night to burn all of these undead animatronics inside, setting all their souls free, and finally sending William Afton to hell. This was reinforced by the purgatory-esque state of the ultimate custom night with the cryptic messages from the animatronics that are addressed to William himself, an amazing ending to our primary antagonist. We then get another possible reinforcement of the death of William Afton through the fifth Fazbear Frights book, wherein the story of the man in room 1280 parallels that of William Afton and ends in death. FNAF VR reintroduces him, but only as a glitch that influenced Vanny and then seemingly left her to do her own thing like a new Jedi Knight, following the orders and teachings of her master, but doing it in her own way. But after all this, to drill it in our heads that William is finally gone and that Vanny is here to stay as the new main antagonist, they barely show Vanny and they just bring back William Afton! What?! It's not even that they just made a mistake, but they not only disregarded, but killed what was previously established and concluded by multiple different games and two different book series. <sighs> Sorry, that makes me very annoyed, but let's continue. Another big problem in this game is the level of immersion and suspension of disbelief that was established by the beginning of this game and many other FNAF games. We establish that this is a very futuristic location with such advanced technologies that you can make huge holograms in multiple different places in this pizzaplex, but all of these cameras still look like FNAF 1 cameras. I understand keeping the aesthetics of the old games, but make the technology consistent. This game starts off by establishing this super advanced pizzaplex that has huge holograms and lifelike animatronics. We even begin to look at this realism with the initial cutscenes and interactions with these animatronics and environments. We are led to believe that this takes place in a world that follows the same rules as ours, but then it begins to get cartoony and goofy. When you finally kill Roxy towards the end of the game, for some reason, we change to multiple different camera angles in this strange slow motion effect like a live replay in a sports game. I understand if you want to make a less serious game, but this is a complete contrast from what was initially established. The look of these animatronics also feel very cartoonish. It's not until the end of the game that we start to see the characters look rough and damaged, and until then, they just seem kind of untextured and unweathered. I understand that this is supposed to be set in the future, but even in the future, things have imperfections. It's not really what people expect from a AAA FNAF game. It completely contrasts the original games. A good idea for what textures and characters should look like in a AAA FNAF game is the still in development Five Nights at Freddy's Plus, which is being made by Fiznom and Click Team. There are some very detailed versions of these well-known animatronics, and they look terrifying. Of course, this isn't the same futuristic aesthetic that they were trying to achieve in Security Breach, but this shows the right mindset you're supposed to be in to make a much higher level version of these originally established characters. You need the details on imperfections and weathering that just isn't present on the Glamrock animatronics, making them look fake. One thing that got everyone excited with this game was the idea of a fully free roam FNAF game. An idea that everybody was thinking about since the teasers came out for FNAF 3. But this game's free roam just felt like a chore. Why did this happen? Two words. Fetch. Quests. Throughout this entire game, you just ran back and forth between rooms that are pretty much on opposite sides of the pizzaplex, just obtaining these random and redundant items to help you escape. Some people might say, well, it's a free roam version of a game where it's pretty much all back and forth, but let's take a look at how Breath of the Wild was structured. It was a Legend of Zelda game where Link wasn't his normal looking self and you pretty much got no instructions, which was never done before by a Legend of Zelda game. A concept that not everyone got behind initially, but they did it perfectly. 
They made a beautiful game that wasn't trying to look or act realistically. You could go anywhere you wanted, even if you weren't ready to go there yet, and you could choose to explore or not explore anything you want. Security Breach, however, held your hand the entire time, not allowing you to enter these locations that you weren't ready for, padding the game by making you run back and forth between different locations after completely scrapping half of the already coded minigames and some entire rooms in the Pizzaplex, and completely removing the shortcuts, making you have to fully run back and forth between these areas in the same paths you always take. You can make a good free roam FNAF game, but Security Breach did it wrong. One thing that Security Breach falls into is the telltale problem. Your choices don't matter. You choose to destroy an animatronic to obtain an item that you can use in your journey, but afterwards you just destroy Roxy and then escape. This choice never mattered. It doesn't influence anything in the actual story. But this isn't the only choice that doesn't matter. Previously, at 1am, the game gave you a choice. You can choose to go to the East Arcade to do an office mission, or you can choose to go to Salads and Sides and do a Pizza Bot mission. But once again, this choice doesn't actually matter. But it's not just that they don't matter. In both missions, you have to do a vent challenge to run away from Mini Music Man, and at the end of both, Vanessa will catch you and bring you to the Lost and Found. Nothing changes in the story from this. The only thing that changes is your location and the animatronics you run from. The road splits into a fork to make you do the exact same things and bring you back to the main road experiencing almost the exact same situation. I would have easily waited another three years just to get the game that was promised to us. In conclusion, the entire team behind Security Breach, not just Steel Wool, pulled the rug out from under all of us with these empty promises, cut moments, and retracted story arcs. However, I do not believe that Security Breach is a bad game. When presenting all of this information in a row like this, it's easy to fall into a this game sucks kind of mindset, but it doesn't suck. It has heart, it has emotion, and you can feel that there was love poured into this game. It's a massive map that's very explorable and has some very fun mini games, but it wasn't the game we were promised. And that's why Security Breach was disappointing.